I'm Rob Lacuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby here with Patrick Hogan, Supervising Sound Editor on Cobra Kai. Um, Patrick, what is the extent to which you and your team have to collaborate with the sound design team, sound mixers on Cobra Kai? And what areas of the overall sonic landscape of the show do you each have to respectively look after to then bring it all together? Uh, good question, because most people, I mean, uh, I would say my parents probably have no idea what I really do, <laughs> yet alone the, the public. It, it's really a case of um, when you're dealing with film or TV, it, it takes a lot of people to make a, a movie or show. You know, even even on a, on, a, on a TV show like this, you're talking there's probably 150 people between production and post-production who work on the show. So while the sound department is one small group of those people, it's still many people working towards a common goal. So there's different positions and different responsibilities that different people have in sound in order to, to get the final product uh, and reinforce the vision and uh, the story that the producers want to tell um, and do it in a timely manner when we know we usually don't all get to work together at the same time. So, so I'm the sound supervisor or supervising sound editor. Uh, my job is basically the liaison between the producers or in a film, it would be the director, but usually in TV, it's the producers, right? So I'm, 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 I'm the, the common thread that, that goes from the producers who will talk about general sound, the themes that they're playing with, the, the, the feeling we want in a scene, things that maybe won't be obvious uh, if you just watched it and didn't know better. They'll give me, you know, we do have what's called spotting sessions. They give me notes. We talk about what they want. Yeah. Then I communicate that to the editors. So then my first job is to take all this information and go to the editors and say, this is what we need to do on this episode of the show. If it was a feature film, it'd be, this is what we need to do for the film. Uh, and kind of, it might be written notes. It might be talking on the phone occasionally. Um, especially the, in the early seasons when you're learning your way, I might sit over the shoulder and they'll play stuff for me and we'll talk about it, and go through, you know, what's working, what's not working. Um, and there's three different parts of that sound. Um, the thing that most people get confused about is the sound supervisor does not handle the music. There's a whole separate department that handles music. So I always like to say I do. When you hear Cobra Kai, everything you hear went through me except for the music. So all the music goes to uh, some other very, very talented people. And they're working concurrently. Same time I'm doing my thing, they're doing their thing. But I'm handling the dialogue, uh, which would be typically what the sound that was recorded on set. Um, ADR, which is additional dialogue that's recorded afterwards. It might be because of a technical issue like noise. There might be a plane flew by, a jet plane flew yeah. by right on an important line. And we really need to hear that line. So we'll replace it to get it clean. It might be a new line. Oftentimes, uh, for TV, especially, you have to cut for time, and it might be you have to cut a scene out to 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 get, to get the show to fit time. And so sometimes you might have to add an ADR line to bridge what got cut out. Oftentimes, you can take a, a three minute scene out, and then you can add one line on the back of someone's head that explains everything that <laughs> happened in that scene. And you take that three minutes, you turn it into three seconds of ADR. So there's many reasons to do ADR, but so dialogue and ADR, uh, and then uh, sound effects and sound design. So sound effects would be kind of the, the, the nuts and bolts. If you see a door close, you hear a door close. Um, you know, if it's a scary neighborhood, you might hear, if it's at night, you might hear owl hoots, uh, owl hoots or, a, or a, you know, train whistle or whatever. And then there's sound design, which would be like in our fight scenes, when we cut into the really cool, where we speed ramp into the slow motion and these moments to kind of show the movement and the impact. Uh, in a in a in another show, it might be monsters or stuff like that. So and then Foley, wow. which is uh, the sound that's created by a team done in real time, where they watch the show and they have a cool stage with different services and different props. And rather than having someone cut each footstep one by one as a sound effect, they literally just put on the type of shoes that the character has and they get on the surface and they actually just rewalk what the character did <clears throat> because when they film, they use very directional mics that are meant to get the dialogue and to exclude all the other sound so that they get that dialogue really clean. And then what Foley is gonna do is add back in all of those sounds, whether it's the feet, whether it's someone brushing some crumbs off their arm or yeah. whatever that might be, that stuff. So all of those things I coordinate and then I make sure it gets to the mix stage where the mixers, which you mentioned, the mixers are the last, they're the gatekeepers. They're the, they're, I always call them, they're the, Arvid, they're the, they're the guardians of taste. They <laughs> blend all of these sounds together in yeah. a way that creates the final mix. And it's and it's because you're getting hundreds of tracks. You know, you have all these Foley things and you have 
yeah. the backgrounds and you have the music and then you have to balance all of those things to create the narrative sonically that goes with the picture and the story that's going on. And so then I sit behind them and while they're working, I'm there to answer questions because the, the producers can't be there for the whole mix, they're busy people. So until the producers come, I'm kind of their proxy. And if, they have, if the mixers have questions, I've spotted, I know the show, I know what the material is and I help, na help them navigate what they need to do so that when the producers come in, we have a, a final mix ready to present to them. You know what, Patrick? I don't think I've ever heard a better explanation than that. I, I thought that was a perfect crash course for anybody and, who doesn't. In TV, we do that in five business days. I Everything know, I, just, I was going to say, <laughs> and then you do it all over days. again, and then again. And it's yeah. just, and with these days, television, pr the production values on television is just so phenomenal. So oh. there's no cutting corners. Everything is so good. Every single show out there has fantastic sound and you're all competing in this marketplace for, for you know, when, when it comes to awards. And I'm only saying that because Gold Derby, we're so interested in awards. So yeah. um, no, it's, it's the golden age right now of the quality really of television right now. It's really amazing. It's amazing. Um, so there's some really intricate ADR dialogue, Foley and sound effects work on Cobra Kai. I would say, particularly when it comes to some of those extended fight sequences, and I'm just saying this as a lay person, I'm not saying I know exactly how you put it all together, but surely the, it, the sound is so crisp and so precise, particularly in the fight scenes with the falls and the hits. Um, uh, just talk us through if you could, if you could, different elements that go into executing all those different sounds so precisely. Sure. I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll try to be brief. You know, I, I could talk for hours on this. But, uh, no, no one wants that. <laughs> Sound guys have to learn to be brief. Uh, so so the first thing is when we first when I first found out we were doing this show, which is and I've been on it from the very beginning. I was really lucky. I, 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 uh, I had a show that ended abruptly and that can be sad, but sometimes it opens great doors. It made me available uh, for the show. So, you know, I always say, you know, always do your best, but if something doesn't work out, maybe it'll lead to something even better. I sure was lucky yeah. with getting Cobra Kai. But um, the first thing it is, I watched the original movie and we kind of used that as the template. Now we knew we didn't want it to sound dated. We didn't want it to sound like 1984, 1985, because the whole point is this is now 30 some years later. And so we were gonna mix it in a more modern tone, but we still wanted to have, um, you know references there's lots of the show has lots of you know we call them easter eggs lots of little hidden bits of dialogue and visuals that harken back to the the movies you know guest cast and all kinds of fun things and so we wanted to do that little bit of sound and I, I one thing i realized is how important foley was in the sound of the karate fights in that yeah. in those original movies and you know what it what it what i thought of what it came what is is that that in these fights these are trained experts so it's not like a like a bar fight where everybody's just kind of rolling around like they're doing very precise movements and what i heard in the foley was this you know when you're wearing those uniforms you have that very hard cloth sound because they're you know they're kind of like a starch thick you know they're the yeah. gi and so we decided to really play that so on our foley we do a separate pass just for karate fight scenes so not for like bar brawls or just like people rolling around but in the actual karate fights we have a separate pass to create that feeling of a very precise motion. So it's not yeah. loose. It's not flat. It's not kind of loose and soft. It's very hard and precise to show that they're doing a maneuver that they've practiced thousands and thousands and thousands of times. So we do that. Um, we also in the ADR. Uh, so so they do, you know, on, in, on set, they'll yell and scream as they fight. But oftentimes it's not usable. Uh, just because, you know, we can't put mics on them when they're fighting uh, because yeah. of what they're doing. So the mic microphone might be really far away. So it might be hard to hear. Uh, some of the shots, every once in a while, it's a stunt double. It's not them. Um, way less of that. Uh, the actors have all trained, like, uh, tremendously. Like, I, I can't believe how far some of them have come from season one to season four and coming up season five. You know, I would say, you know, for some of these actors, they've gone from, from you know, having 50-50 stunt person, them doing these maneuvers. To some of them, like uh, uh, like Tanner, I, I, who plays Robbie, I think he, I think ninety nine point nine nine percent of seasons four and five are him. I don't know if there's really any stunt work. You yeah. know, I think it's all him. But they do still come in to do ADR. And one thing that we do is when they're doing efforts for karate tournament fights or fights where they're, you know, doing their moves, um, they don't just kind of yell. You know, oftentimes fight efforts are just like. Ugh, uh, 
but we have them actually do the kya, so kya, kya, because that's what you do when you when you practice. So we're trying to show that these people who are fighting are different from just your average brawl. And so yeah. the fully plays a large role, the ADR. And then of course, uh, in sound effects, we cut multiple tracks of sound. Every punch isn't comprised of just one single track. I would say every punch is probably on average three or four different tracks so that the mixer yeah. can subtly this is why, and, and his name is Chris Carpenter, and he's, if you look up his credits, he's amazing. Uh, he's been doing this yeah. a long time, and he really knows what he's doing, and it shows, or you can hear it. Um, he, he'll, he'll, you know, each punch, you, if you adjust, you can add a little bit of more of the low end or a little bit more of the high end, and that can help indicate how hard the punch is, where exactly it's hitting, you know, are you hitting more in the fleshy part, or are you hitting more in the bone? Um, you know, we have some punches where we want to have, have them hitting the sternum, so we have more of a crack sound versus if it's a less dangerous punch over here in a more fleshy part. So we can do all those little things. Uh, you'll never, you know, none of these things taken by themselves are things that you will notice as you hear it. But I think all, and when you add it all together, it gets that, like you said, that idea that you're watching something different and unique in Cobra Kai and, and that it's yeah. uh, karate, you know, these, these kids and adults really know what they're doing when they fight. That's right. And um, it's, a, it's a very subtle way that the sound teams are able to propel the narrative without us even realizing it because the punches they do come out they they, they are very effective viscerally for us the audience and and uh and i was explaining to someone the other day it's not necessarily the visual impact of it it's the sound that you don't even realize so that's yeah. fascinating yeah i was just i actually got a chance just recently to meet the stunt coordinators for the show which is really cool because usually you know they're at the beginning in production and we're at the end and we never get to meet yeah and we had a good laugh because we it's like it took it takes the two of us you know they make sure the actors don't actually hit each other so they're safe and then we make it sound like they do yeah. right like you need both parts like the choreography has to be so great to make it look like they're hitting each other even when they aren't and then we provide all of the sounds that make it so that you don't even think that they're not hitting each other like it's just there are actually you know yeah. going at it with each other and you know what was so interesting? It's a great segue. Thank you for raising it. Um, when the when it comes to the Emmys, where does the show excel in stunts and in sound? Because it's the beginning and the yeah. end of what we of the core of the show, apart from the characters, and it's the fights, right? And yeah. it's the core. It's yeah. that visual element, and then the impact of the sound. I mean, you, it's brilliant. I love that those two are getting recognized. I'd love for more parts of Cobra Kai Same. to get recognized. Obviously, I'm I'm biased. Yeah. Um, you know it's. I don't, you know, and it's, it's, I, I totally get it, but you know, the things that this show does, you know, this show is a very, a by, and I, I don't want to, you know, mock all those wonderful people out there making their, their independent films and, and stuff, but this is low budget by, by, you know, Hollywood standards, this show. Yeah. And what we do on, you know, a shoestring budget is, is really amazing. Um, and, you know, they don't, they don't offer the, you know, they don't do the awards, you know, average per dollar spent <laughs> uh, they should but uh maybe but, they um, should yeah but it's uh, i'm really proud of what everybody does all the way across the board uh, on this show uh just elevating everything about it way it's you know i always say this show is way better than it needs to be you know it's just yeah. people would love it just just because it's the karate kid but but all the people who work on it make it you know a quality show yeah absolutely it, it, it could have been terrible and you still would have had the fans um, he just loved the the action. But as I said to um, Josh, John and Hayden, the showrunners and creators, they've really elevated this. And like particularly, for example, Josh's direction of the season finale with the tournament, I was just, it was breathtaking. I couldn't believe what they put together. And you, you of course, had a huge part of that in that finale. Did you, have you actually watched the finale back just as a viewer? And what was your reaction knowing what went into it? I did. I did watch it back. Um, I, you know, it, it, from the time we finish, it's usually months and months before it actually comes out because Netflix has to make their foreign versions and dub it into foreign yeah. languages and they have to do their advertising. You know, it's in, in, in a lot of television, oftentimes it airs three days after you are done. But this is kind of more feature style where, where you do it and then it's months before. So I get to go. I want to see them. I want to make sure everything's translating properly. Um, on Netflix when it when it comes out, and um, I think the thing that really um, that I'd forgotten when I watched it was 
how well there were three kind of cool technical things that were done in that final up or those final two episodes. One was the use of they shot almost everything at 72 frames per second, which is three times the standard frame rate that we, we do here in the US, which is 24 frames for film and TV. So it was, shot, it was shot three times faster, which meant that if you just played it back, it was three times slower. So it was slow motion. But then they did this, this speed ramping where they would change the speed of the shot. So at first they'd be moving very slow, then they'd move very fast and they'd move very slow again. So like a punch would start slow, go fast and then go slow again. Um, that, was, that was done, that was a combination of the choreography and what Josh did on with directing it and the camera work, right? Mm -hmm. Then there was the sound design that we added to that to give it uh, a visual style to match the visual, the, to give the, to give the, the a, an aural impact the same the visual did. Um, and then on top of that, Zach and Leo scored this like just gargantuan score. And, you know, they, they recorded it with an orchestra, like a 110 piece orchestra or something. And, and, uh, um, I wanted to watch them score, but they did it like three in the morning. They, 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 I don't know, they don't <laughs> sleep. Um, yeah. But all three of those things had, were, were done by separate groups of people, but it all came together at the end and flows. So it seems like it couldn't have been done any other way. I mean, there are so many ways all the different pieces could have been put together. But when I watch it just as a, as a fan, you're not paying attention to just the score or just the sound design or just those visuals. They all kind of come together. And it's just like this amazing fights that are just so epic. And it's, you know, it's kind of like you're watching like a Marvel movie for a little bit there with the way this thing's yeah. going, you know, and uh, that was fun to see how it all came together like that. Yeah, I uh, didn't, I just didn't think they could top what they, how they ended season one and they absolutely did. It was really, really entertaining. And my final question is about the Emmys. Um, it was so wonderful to see uh, both sound teams nominated um, at the, in the two uh, relevant sound categories, you're the only show that could do that apart from Ted Lasso. And that, so that's yeah. an achievement in itself. You're both there. How did it feel to be nominated? And do you recall, like it was a long time ago now, but do you recall the morning of when you, when you saw that you were nominated finally for the show? Yeah. <laughs> I can tell a funny story about that. First off, uh, I love and hate Ted Lasso. I hate them for being so good. <laughs> I hate their, I love that show. I love that show. So I got to give, Ted Lasso props, the, the, the people who work on that show do it. I don't know them, but they do a phenomenal job and I love the show. I'm a big Ted Lasso fan myself. Same. Yep. Um, but um, as, far as, uh, as far as it goes with Cobra Kai, you know, um, uh, working with the, the mixers are, are, are Judge Angelus and, and Chris Carpenter. And uh, Cobra Kai was the very first show that I, I did with them. Um, but since then we've done like four shows together. So for the past year, I've basically lived on their stage and got to watch them work. And it, it, you know, when you have good people at the end, those gatekeepers, uh, you know, of taste, um, it really makes it easy because you know they make really good choices and they they take the material and they really shape it and 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 what they put out is just uh, amazing. So I think they should always be nominated for everything they do. Um, that morning, so I was, I was working out on the elliptical because it was early in the morning when they announced and I'm like, oh, I'll go on and see if, you know, I was like, you know, I think, you know, this was season three, um, yeah. which, uh, ended, um, with the, with the, uh, the, the fights in the house and then the big fight at the dojo. I don't want to forget those people, but it, 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 that last episode was really cool and had some really challenging stuff in a very different way from what season four had, but still challenging. And now we were on, that was the first season, season three was the first time we were on Netflix. So the first two seasons were wonderful. And I would tell everybody about the show, but uh, the YouTube originals Sorry. just didn't take off. It didn't, they, they, they got in too late. It was, they were, they, they did some good shows. They worked hard. They just, they didn't time it right. Yeah. And people didn't want to pay for yet another service for just a couple shows. So I would tell everybody about Cobra Kai, but nobody watched it. And then it came out on Netflix and it went, I mean, it was it, it timed perfectly with the pandemic and everybody's at home yeah. and for shows and Netflix was really smart. They bought the third season of a show, but they also bought the first two seasons. So they were able to drop three seasons over six months and just kind of feed the, feed the, oh, the Cobra Kai so fandom. Yeah. Um, and so, and, you know, and when it comes to, to awards, you know, people have to know the show to vote for it, right? Like exactly. no matter how good you can have the best work in the world, but if no one watches it, 
you're, you can't get nominated. That's just, that's just the nature of how award shows work. So we were like, we're really proud of the season. It's now on Netflix. Everybody's watched it. I think we got a shot. So I, I went on and I went to the website and it was really funny. The, the way the website worked is it, 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 it had each category, like a list of what that category would be. And then it just had like um, the logos of each of the shows that got nominated. Like it wasn't text. It was like the, the logo of yeah. the show, like yeah. a poster kind of yeah. thing. And I got to, to our category and I, well, first I saw the mixing and I saw that Joe and Chris got nominated. I was like, yeah, that's awesome. I saw that the, it had been, I'd already scrolled and I saw that it had been nominated for best comedy. And I saw that it had been nominated for best stunts. And I finally get down to my category and we weren't there. And I was like, oh, and there uh -huh. were only, I was like, and they only, then usually there's five, there were only four shows listed. And I thought, wow, that's, you know, what a, what a bummer. Like, I, I, I felt like we were one of the five best shows and they only nominated four. Um, and then people started congratulating me. And I realized that the graphic had gotten messed up and it had come through as it was black text on a black background. <laughs> so the first four shows were listed and then there was just a blank black square. But when they fixed it, you then saw that the Cobra Kai one was the last square, but on my screen, mm -hmm. it was just because it was black text on a black background. It just looked like, yeah. an, like an empty slot. Yeah. And so then I found out that we were uh, nominated and that was, that was very cool. It was, uh, it was my I eighth Emmy even, nomination yeah. and my first time as a sound supervisor. So my, my first that's time. Right. Uh, as, it's sorry, a really good, great. That's a good story. I, um, I think it's actually a better way because you're just like, oh, what a yeah, shame. All right. I had already I come to terms with you're it. In. <laughs> and Ted Lasso and Love, Death and Robots. I was like, man, those are good shows. I can't, I can't mm -hmm. knock yeah. the shows they picked. So I had already come to terms with it. And then I found out, no, we're, we were nominated after all. So. That's brilliant. Well, I hope that we see you again on the Emmys red carpet very soon. In the meantime, season five is coming out very soon. We're super excited. Thank you, Patrick, for your time today. Thank you for the crash course. I really appreciated it. Hey, thank you. It was a lot of fun. You know, the usually we're in the, we're in the background behind the scenes. So I appreciate shining a little light on on what we do and giving people a, a little insight into uh, how sound gets done in film and TV. Thank you. Mm -hmm.